When many people hear of a chi-squared distribution, they tend to think of it often in the context of goodness of fit tests. So looking at how well a given proposed distribution describes an observed data set. Now, when you're told how to do this, most people, particularly if you're not a mathematics or statistics major, if you come through something in the life sciences, you tend to think of this as a routine to follow, to look at how different a set of observations is, mid expectation. But at its core is the central limit theorem and the fact that squaring standard normals and summing them gives uh, chi-squared variables. Now, it isn't instantly obvious why that's the case. But let's say that we've got a coin and somebody tells us that this coin is biased towards heads. I think that when you flip the coin, it's going to land heads with probability 70% on each flip and therefore tails 30% on each flip. So that's my hypothesis. So I either want to, uh, I want to look at that hypothesis and gather some evidence and either say, having gathered my evidence, I still believe that, or no, the evidence I've gathered makes me reject that. I no longer believe that based on this evidence. So the example I'm going to do is trying to justify or reject the belief that this coin lands heads with probability 0.7. So in this totally fictitious scenario, we flip the coin 40 times and get 20 heads, 20 tails. Before I return to the specific example on the previous slide, I want to discuss the general case. So if I flip the coin n times, and I expected to have a proportion P, if my hypothesis were correct, proportion P of heads, but instead I observed M heads. Then the central limit theorem tells me that the distribution of what I would observe, M, minus the well, hypothesized population mean of NP heads, divide by uh, the population variance over N, would be approximately standard normal. Now what I've used there is the fact that for a binomial with parameters N and P, it has expectation NP and variance NP one minus P. I've maybe been a little bit slack with notation of a capital and lowercase n's. In general, I'll use n, I'll use lowercase for something that's not variable and uppercase for something that is. Um, for reasons of later notation, I've left the capital N in there, but maybe you might justify this better with a lowercase n. Anyway, but if I take that that is distributed as a standard normal, and that's just the central limit theorem doing its magic in the background for a large enough sample size. Then if I square it, the square of a standard normal will be a chi-squared with one degree of freedom. So I just expand that, square the numerator and the uh, denominator. Then I hope we can easily see that what we get is m minus np all squared divided by np1 minus p. Now, I've uh, split that into partial fractions into one fraction over np and one fraction over n1 minus p. Now, that's not instantly obvious that those um, two statements are equivalent. They are, and if you're doing the 37262 uh, tutorial this week, then you can expect to justify that as one of the questions. If not, you can get a jump on that by uh, practicing or justifying that yourself. It's not instantly obvious. There's a little bit of a trick, but I'm sure you're all trusting people and you believe that I'm not lying that those two statements are equivalent.
The next question being, why would I wish to write it in that form of an m minus np squared over np plus n minus m minus n1 minus p all squared over n1 minus p? And that's because both terms are of this same form of what did I observe? I observed m heads. How many heads did I expect under this hypothesis? NP. And I, sub I square how many more or less I observed than expected of heads divided by NP, which is how many heads I expected. The second term is effectively the same, but how many not heads, how many tails? If I observed M heads out of N flips, then I observed N minus M tails. If I expected NP heads, I expected N one minus P tails. So both of these terms are of the same form, which is what did I observe from the category minus what did I expect under the hypothesis? Square that and divide by the expectation and add those up. Now that's sometimes called the Pearson statistic, named after Carl Pearson. Now, when we can invoke the central limit theorem, so the central limit theorem is true for large samples, what's sufficiently large for all of these assumptions to hold? Well, different courses, different textbooks will give you different answers. We usually say that we don't want to be dividing by anything with a particularly small expectation, because being slightly wrong in that denominator, E, can lead to the fraction blowing up, tending towards something very large. So we tend to say that if we're using this for a chi-squared goodness of fit test, we want expected counts of at least, say, five. And uh, that's Carl Pearson himself. Uh, I wouldn't Google the man. He had some pretty, uh, pretty interesting or pretty, uh, by modern standards, pretty tasteless views. Anyway. So how does this work? Well, I will return to my original example of somebody telling me that I had a coin that had 70% chance of landing heads. So if that were true, when flipped 40 times, I would expect 28 heads and 12 tails. But in this case, we observed 20 and 20. So obviously, I don't think I will get the uh, hypothesized values of 18 and 12 every time. But I want to see whether my 20 and 20 is too far removed from that for me to continue to retain that hypothesis. So I work out the OI minus EI squared over EIs, add them together, and I'll get 7.62. So that's a measure of how much my data set disagrees with my hypothesis. If I got exactly what I would expect, then I would get a Pearson statistic of zero. There's no disagreement, no possible reason not to keep faith in the hypothesis. And the bigger and bigger and bigger the statistics gets, the more my observation and my, and my hypothesis disagree with each other. But if I compare that on a, uh, a quantile of the chi-squared with one degree of freedom, I find that that is the 99.4th percentile. So in other words, 99.4% um, of values in a chi-squared one are less than this 7.62. So even at a 5% level or a 1% level, I would not retain this null hypothesis. I'd reject it and say, I don't believe this is 70% chance of heads.